you are programming neural pathways in your brain. There is no bad stuff just waiting to jump on you and jump down your throat because sometimes these snacks be doing that. My name is Cola and you are watching Kaboko Fitness. If you have ever had the experience of eating so much you feel sick to your stomach and you cannot move, this video is for you. A lot of people that struggle with overeating are very hard on themselves. They think it's because they don't have discipline and if only they just had more discipline then they wouldn't overeat. That's not necessarily the case. That could be part of it but that's not really the root of the issue. Before I dive into the solutions there are a couple of things I just want to dispel. If you struggle with overeating it's not because there's something wrong with you, it's not because you are lazy because you don't have self-discipline because you don't have self-control because healthy foods taste bad it's not because of those reasons the true cause of overeating and I'm not talking about just like eating a little bit too much here and there I'm talking about chronic overeating the kind of overeating that leads to massive weight gain and that weight just keeps building up and you just can't seem to shake it that's the kind of overeating I'm talking about. So if it's not all these things that I just mentioned, then what is it? What is the cause and how can you fix it? I'll tell you. The number one root cause of overeating in 95% of people is the habit loop. What is the habit loop? Allow me to explain. The best way to explain this habit loop is through an example. So I'm gonna use my friend Mandy. Mandy works at one of the top management consulting firms in the country and she is awesome at her job. However, Mandy does have a little bit of a habit loop going on and she's aware of this and it's a loop that causes her to gain weight. Here's what her loop looks like. Every single day, around 2.30, Mandy starts to complain that she's tired, she wants to go home. What she would typically do is she will go to the office kitchen and get a snack. She will temporarily feel better. There's her loop. So let me break it down for you. The loop the habit loop is comprised of three distinct steps. Step one is the trigger. Step two is the action. And step three is the reward. In Mandy's example, her trigger is that feeling of tiredness at 2.30 in the afternoon. Her action is the intelligent choice to go to the break room and get something to snack on. And then the reward is that feeling of temporarily feeling better after having something to eat. The thing that's tricky about habit loops is that the trigger is so difficult to identify. So it's very easy for you to see how this can cause long-term overeating. It sounds so simple, but it's so difficult to identify. Not all habit loops are bad. There are certain habit loops that are just bad habits, and there are some habit loops that lead to weight gain. So let me give you an example of an actual habit loop in my life. When I wake up in the morning, I tell you, I cannot go on with my day without drinking my green tea with honey in it. Even if I am fasting, I will drink my green tea with honey in it in the morning. This is a habit loop for me. My trigger is that I am awake and it is dark when I wake up in the morning. My action is to drink my green tea and my reward is that caffeine boost that just gets me going in the morning. It's a habit loop. 95% of people that struggle with overeating have a habit loop operating in their lives. Some of them have multiple habit loops and it is so difficult to see your own loop. So my best advice to you first of all would be to ask someone that lives with you that can be honest if they can help you spot any loops. For some people, their habit loops are they need to pee. So they go to the bathroom, they pee. On the way back from the bathroom, they pass by the kitchen and they grab a snack and then they go back to whatever they were doing before they had to pee. That is a habit loop. The trigger is that feeling of needing to pee. The action is going to pee and the reward is getting something to eat on the way back from the bathroom. Such a harmless activity. But over time, doing that repeatedly, multiple times a day, especially if you work from home, the real catch 22 with these habit loops also is that they have a physical effect on your brain. If you were to compare with your brain after a habit loop, it's not the same brain. Every time you repeat that loop, you are programming neural pathways in your brain. And eventually, you start to do these loops automatically without even realizing you're doing it. That's why sometimes losing weight can be so difficult because you're doing everything right. You're eating, you're exercising, you're being self-aware, but you're also processing through these habit loops that you don't know is even happening. It is literally programmed into your brain, running in the background without your permission or your awareness. But now that you know, 
you can do something different. The first group of people I want to talk to in this video are my people that struggle with a sweet tooth. If you struggle with a sweet tooth, Especially if you notice that eating sweet things is part of your habit loop. There is hope and here's what you can do instead of going from loving sweets to Loving broccoli. That's a huge leap. Most people will be unsuccessful long term trying to do that Realistically speaking. So here's what I would suggest do some substitutions instead of the Oreos try some dried fruit Try some raisins. I know it's not the same thing. What I'm saying though is if you're serious about weight loss, this is a nice way to gradually just transition out of those high sugar, highly processed foods that may be forming part of your loop. So once you identify your habit loop, if you see that eating sugary things is part of a habit loop for you, a substitution you can make is to eat more frozen fruit or things like raisins or even fresh fruit. For example, in Mandy's case, instead of going to the break room and getting that bad stuff, maybe she can get the strawberries instead. That is still a more manageable midpoint between the cupcakes and eating broccoli. This topic of substitutions is also something that I talk about in both the 30 day challenge and the 21 day belly fat focus program. So if you're a member on my site, make sure you check out those food guides if this topic is resonating with you. And if you're not yet a member on my site, go to kobokofitness.com, start a 10 day free trial and see if my programs are right for you. One substitution that is usually good for most people is eating yogurt. So instead of ice cream, go for the yogurt. Research has actually shown that yogurt it could be one of the key cornerstone foods to add to a healthy diet. If you are trying to lose weight, consider adding yogurt to your diet, as, especially as a replacement for other foods that may be more highly processed and not as good for your gut. My next tip is to keep all your unhealthy food in a designated area in your house. In the ideal scenario, you will just throw it all away. But the reality that I've come to understand from working with a lot of you and also from my personal life is you spend good money to buy this stuff. And even though it's bad for you, it hurts the soul to throw away yummy snacks <laughs> that you spent money on. If that's you, a midpoint is to find one area in your house and put all the candy there, all the chocolates, everything. So there is no temptation in your day to day when you're just walking around the kitchen, walking around the house, there is no bad stuff just waiting to jump on you and jump down your throat because sometimes these snacks be doing that. And one of the things this does for you, other than preventing you from accidentally eating these things, it also forces you to make that decision to walk your legs over to the cabinet or the drawer where you know it's nothing but bad news you know what's in that drawer but you're going there so you're making a conscious decision I think that this is one of the most important parts of taking control of your eating it's just realizing that it's just taking back your power from that habit loop and beginning to make more conscious choices as opposed to unconscious choices even if you still end up doing the same action you are still making progress just by transitioning from that state of unconsciousness where your habit loop is just running in the background to making a more conscious effort to still do the same behaviors this one is going to be a struggle for so many people because I know that a lot of us were raised to finish our food and if you didn't finish your food, you would be in trouble. So this one is going to be something where it's kind of like an unlearning of past behaviors. You probably know what I'm about to say, and that is to not always finish the food on your plate. If you're a person that struggles with overeating, give yourself permission to not finish the food. Now, if you're still living with your parents or you are a younger viewer watching this video, you may not have much control over this particular point. What I will suggest is maybe there are ways to like get your family members to watch this video. My next tip is to eat without distractions. It's one of the best ways to be more intentional with the food, more mindful of the food, more aware of the food. I notice personally that if I'm watching TV, watching YouTube or scrolling my phone when I eat, I have no recollection of eating the food. I know I ate the food because the food is gone from my plate, but I do not remember consuming them calories. And you know what happens? I want to eat more. And I will typically go get seconds because I have no self-control. This next tip I'm gonna tell you based on research and science, eating more slowly is scientifically proven to help eat less. This one, I have to be totally honest with you, is a struggle for me. I inhale my food. I eat so fast. And I do it because it feels so good. So this is one that's hard for me to say to you, 
but it's my job <laughs> and I gotta do my job. My next tip is to control your stress levels. If you think back to Mandy, the reason why she would go to the break room to go get a snack was because she was tired. She was stressed at 2.30 in the afternoon. That afternoon period tends to be very high stress for her. She just wants to go home, but she cannot. So controlling stress levels is one of the most important ways. If you look at your habit loop and you realize that your trigger is stress, then you have to get the stress under control. Next tip, do not just stop eating all the foods you like and then bring in all new recipes that you think are going to be good for you. The reason for that is that it's not sustainable and it can be very expensive. This is one of the things that I hear a lot from people I work with and that is that the whole healthy eating thing sometimes is just expensive. I understand what you're saying and it's even more expensive when we try to just swap out all our normal foods for healthy foods but then we don't really eat those healthy foods because we don't like them or we don't want to cook them or there's no time to figure out how to cook them so we go back and then we eat McDonald's. Let's not do that. Let's identify healthy foods to introduce into our diet, unhealthy foods to take out of the diet, and also the favorite foods we're going to keep. It's all about sustainability. So if you are that all or nothing person that you want to throw everything out and bring all things new in, do that because I feel like you have to get that out of your system. But when you do it, if it doesn't work for you, then I hope you will consider this point that I'm making to take it a bit more slowly, keep some of your favorite foods, keep some of your familiar foods, and then take out just a few unhealthy foods and replace just a few of those unhealthy foods with healthier options. You will start to experience the benefits of reprogramming foods, which is something I talked about in my previous video. You will also start to experience the weight loss benefits of removing those unhealthy foods, and that will be your fuel and your motivation to change even more. It's a cumulative effect. My next tip is to have some goals. There are some people where goals are actually demotivating because when you don't reach them, you just feel bad. If that's you, then just ignore me. Don't listen to this. But if you find that achieving goals is something that motivates you, don't be afraid to set some goals. However, you have to remember to set long-term goals and short-term goals. Your long-term goals can be outcome goals. Your long-term goal can be something like, I want to lose 50 pounds in 2020, or I want to weigh 160 pounds by 2021. Those are long-term outcome goals. In the short term, however, it's so important to have performance goals. I'm going to work out with Cola every day, Monday through Friday, for 10 minutes. You need both. You need those long-term outcome goals that you can't really control, and then your short-term performance goals, which is the things that you are going to do that will get you to that outcome goal. Next tip is to keep a food journal. This is not something where you write down every single thing you eat down to the gram for the rest of your life. It's not that. You have to find out what level of journaling works for you. For me personally, when I was first learning portion sizes and learning how much of things were and trying to figure out what was appropriate for my body, I just had all sorts of apps I used to try out and I would log my meals and I would see how many calories were in things and I would understand how much certain things affected my body and things like that. And then over time, I developed an intuitive sense of everything. So now I can look at a plate of food and I know how many grams of carbs protein and fat are in it. I can estimate the calories just by looking at it. I know portion sizes, but that information didn't just fall into my head from the sky. I learned it by logging my food. So that is one of the main benefits of keeping a food journal. The other benefit of having a food journal is that it can alert you to things that you may be doing without even realizing that you're doing it. Because you might think that I don't snack a lot. I used to think that. I still think that to a certain extent. But then when you journal, you just realize that actually I'd be out here eating all the nuts in the pantry, eating all the cliff bars in the trunk of my car, eating all the baby food. It's good because it helps with self-awareness. The last thing about journaling meals that I think is really important to know is that it can even help change behavior. So if you know that you are writing down or tracking your food with an app, for a lot of people, it actually causes them to make better choices with regard to what they're eating, which is pretty freaking amazing if you ask me. I definitely recommend getting into that habit of writing down what you're eating or using an app to track it. And if you're already doing that, shout out to you, you're doing something good for yourself. Remember, all of these tips are to be implemented within the context of a habit loop. That first step is figuring out your habit loop. What are those unconscious behaviors that cause you to eat 
and you're not even aware of it. Again, I strongly recommend talking to somebody that lives with you, that spends a lot of time with you, that knows you really well, so they can help you identify your habit loop, so you can understand which of these tips make sense for you, so you can break that cycle and get onto your goals. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already, and I will see you in my next video.